like to share a little bit of my story. And um, it's, I think with all of our lives, our stories end up very different than what we might have expected. But mine, um, we, my husband and I have been living in Japan for about 20 years. We spent our first two years in Sendai, actually, and love Sendai. And then after that, we were down in Kobe, where we adopted our four children. And we're, we've been there for quite a few years. When 2011, March 11th, that <clears throat> triple disaster hit Japan. And we were devastated. We saw all of those images, as I'm sure you did as well, and began to uh, just wonder how could we be involved in what's going on there is that working for everybody okay great um so you all remember the images but it was devastating and my husband within a couple of days had joined some friends and drove a two-ton truck up with a lot of supplies and made about 16 trips that first year, just mudding out homes and passing out supplies, doing whatever it seemed was going to help people at that time. A year later, after realizing that the needs were not going to go away quickly, we decided as a family to move up to Ishinomaki. And this is a city that was one of the worst hit by the tsunami itself with 50% of the homes being washed away. <clears throat> So we joined with a team called B1, which was other international Christian workers trying to make a difference. And as a family, we wanted to figure out how can we do life in this place that has been so devastated. So we were trying to find housing and um, we put our kids into the nearest local school that had also been very badly damaged by the disaster waters um, and the school was damaged so school buses would come and pick up the kids and take all the kids to a nearby temporary school so i would take our kids there and the moms would have smiles on their faces put their kids on the bus but when the buses left i would see these devastated women whose lives had been completely upended and who had lost so very much what was interesting is these women helped me. I didn't know the new school system. I didn't know when we needed to pack lunches, but these women were my encouragement, even though I had moved there to help them. And I love that that's how this whole story started. But as I became friends, I heard their stories of grief and loss. And I realized many of them had nothing to do and nothing to go to. During one of um, my early times there, we worked at this park and the park had things like huge truck parts and broken glass everywhere and debris, things that should never be in a park for children. And we were cleaning up um, and everywhere I looked, there were these pieces of broken pottery littering the ground. It was all over Ishinomaki, it was anywhere because as the tsunami had come in, it took out with it all of the dishes that were in people's homes and it, it left these pieces everywhere. And I started to wonder, could we do something with the broken pottery and give a place for women to gather? And even if we are never, never able to be successful, is it a place that we could provide community at least? Well, you've probably heard as I have that necessity is the mother of invention. We had a huge need. We had these women who were desperate for hope and community. And we, in a sense, we had this beautiful natural resource. We had all of this broken pottery. And so we worked with volunteers and we picked up broken pottery. Our kids would fill up buckets full and bring it back. We consulted some jewelry designers and they came to Ishinomaki for 10 days. And they began to teach us how to make jewelry from the broken pottery. You know, as we were first trying to decide on a name for this new social enterprise, one of the women who had lost her mother and sister in the tsunami, she said, Sue, I don't care what we name it, but the word has to mean hope because this is the only place that I've gone that I have found hope. 
And so the Nozomi Project was born. Nozomi means hope in Japanese, and it's also a woman's name. So during our first uh, months there of trying to set up Nozomi Project, I speed read a bunch of books on social enterprises. I didn't know what I was doing. None of us did. And I forget everything that I read except for one sentence that became my mantra, and that was, do the right next thing. Starting something new like this in a city that has been devastated was overwhelming. <laughs> we could focus on a hundred different things at one time that needed to be done. And, and I would, I remember I would come home to our temporary house and make dinner, get our four kids in bed, and then think, where do I start? What do I do? Well, do the right next thing. And that was always what got me through was doing the right next thing. And it got me through those tough months and it has gotten me through other times where when life has felt overwhelming. So I was often asked those first years, uh, what's your business plan? Or uh, when are you going to turn all this over to your Japanese partners? And I didn't have an answer to those questions. We honestly just proceeded step by step doing the right next thing with a lot of prayer. You know, as the first years um, came and went, um, we were miraculously able to make nice jewelry and it was a business and it's still in business, which is amazing to me. But I began to realize my goal really shouldn't be to turn over this business to Japanese, but instead, our secret sauce in doing this business is the combination of Japanese and North Americans teaming up and working together and bringing our strengths together. You know, my Japanese teammates, they brought with them things that I didn't have, the precision, the ability to create systems, the uh, making things work together. And then me and our North American teammates, we brought with us kind of the fun, the spontaneity, the connections, the things that have been able to give life to Nozomi when we've needed it. Quite honestly, this shared ownership of Nozomi among our different cultures has been really hard at times and it has stretched us. It has made us go much slower than we might've gone if it was just North American or just Japanese, but it's what has strengthened us. It has strengthened us as a business. It has helped me to grow so much as a leader. I know that Nozomi, we would have never survived if it wasn't for our manager, Yuko, who has the ability to organize things in a way I never could. And our grinder, our lead grinder, Chiami, who can look with the perfect eye at one piece of pottery and know what it needs. I have to tell you, these artisans, these women, most with barely a high school education, they have become really amazing at what they do. And it's this teamwork that I'm so proud of. At Nozomi, we have as our tagline, beauty and brokenness. It's not beauty from brokenness, but both are true, but it's beauty in brokenness where we're able to see beauty. And I find that even though our work at Nozomi is evolving, we never really move beyond our brokenness. So I lead Nozomi from my strengths, but also very much from my brokenness. I make mistakes every day in Japanese. And the earlier talk about Japanese culture, I was like, oh, I've done that wrong. Oh, I've done that wrong. Um, but I love that as a team, Yuko and I and the rest of our teammates, we can bring our broken places and somehow we can create something that's uniquely and wholly beautiful. I think um, as I've thought about our social enterprise over the past eight years, the greatest challenge for me has been finding the right balance between operating a social enterprise and a business where we need to keep a profit. So in different seasons, I feel like we've erred in one direction and then we've had to recalibrate and go in the other direction. But through all of this time, there have been three overarching values that have remained at the top for Nozomi. And those, those are transformation, collaboration, and blessing. 
We have received many blessings to get us started, to move us forward step by step. And we've chosen as a value that we want to be a blessing. So we donate over 20% of our annual profit to different organizations around the world who need help more than we do now. And we have this holding hope necklace in which we donate portions of each sale to stop human trafficking. It's part of what has become the fabric of Nozomi is the idea of blessing. And then we also have chosen collaboration and we recognize how important this has been in helping us get started with all of the volunteers who came, the different teams who've given us expertise. We have partnered right now with shops in Tokyo, London, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Hong Kong. And we love that. We love that there's this partnership across the world and we're saying we're gonna help each other succeed. And then there's been word of mouth of people who have sponsored us, who have written about us, who've told about us, shared our story. And we've, um, since we've started, we've sent 60,000 pieces to 45 countries around the world. And that's because of great collaboration and people who work together. You know, we've had some really wonderful customers. We've had some who you would never know who have encouraged us greatly and some who you might know. Um, Chef Robert Irvine of the Food Network channel. He loved Nozomi and sponsored us, which was so cool. And then the former first lady of Japan, Abe Akie, she wore her Nozomi necklace to a state dinner with President and Mrs. Trump a few years ago. And what we loved even more than that was that she made a visit to our workshop last year. Um, that's her and me with two of our kids. But she also came alongside of Nozomi and said, I love what you're doing and I want to be a part of this. But my favorite piece, I think, of collaboration has been what's happening right now. And I'd like to share a little of that with you. So as I have been working at Nozomi, I've been on a journey and moving toward more ethical awareness. And Nozomi has as well. So our family, two years ago, we made a trip to Cambodia. And we, we wanted to have our kids experience life in a developing country, but we didn't realize how much it was going to change all of us. And we came back from that saying, how can we make a difference? How can we collaborate more? And we have since taken two groups of women from Nozomi to Cambodia. And we have been trying to help women there get started in finding jobs. And the women there often get put into jobs they would never choose because they're in such a vulnerable place. So this month at Nozomi, we are super excited. We're releasing our first ethically sourced collection. And those blue gift bags, those are being made by our Cambodian women counterparts who are making it from recycled denim. Our third value of transformation I've seen that in so many ways, in small and big ways. I have been stretched and grown and changed in the past eight years. And I think, I hope that the 30 some women who have worked with me have also experienced different degrees of transformation. So I'd like to tell you briefly about one of my friends there named C. She has given me permission to share this, but C was the shyest woman I've ever met in my life, and I've met a lot of shy women, but I met her on the schoolyard and I would go up to her and try to say hi. And she didn't even know what to do with this crazy blonde foreigner who was probably over the top too friendly. But she would bring to school every day, her son who has severe autism and put him on the bus. And one day I went up and invited her to come and be part of Nozomi. And she looked at me like I was again, a crazy woman and I thought, oh, I'm never going to see her again. Well, I was shocked when she showed up the next morning after I invited her. She came and the day after that, the day after that, and it's now been eight years. At Nozomi, she was super shy. And by her own admission, she was not very skilled with her hands. She had been a dishwasher her whole life before coming. But she persevered. 
And she worked in our necklace room for a few years. Then we had her try out grinding. It's now been about four years that she's been on our grinding team. She started with the real rough and simple, getting more difficult. Yesterday, our lead grinder brought in a tray of C's work. It was the finest, thinnest earrings that we make, our May collection. C has made those earring sets. We all celebrated so much growth, transformation, and beauty that's happening in our midst. And you know, one day C shared with me about a bigger transformation than just her job. She said, I always thought that our family and son had received a curse because of my son's disability. But I've realized since working here at Nozomi and experiencing change myself, that he is not cursed, but rather he's a blessing. He's a blessing to me, to our family, to our community. My whole view of the world has changed. It's such a joy, even through the challenges, as we go step by step in this business, to be able to see the repercussions of blessing, of collaboration, of transformation. I see it in my own needs, my own places of brokenness. I see it in that of my Ishinomaki coworkers. And I see transformation going on across the world in ways I would have never dreamed. I'm really thankful to God, who I think is the author of every creative idea for the way that he works in micro and macro ways to guide us step by step and let us create beauty from what has been broken. So thanks so much for letting me share and listening to my story. I'm really uh, thankful to be here and able to share with you some of the cool things happening here in Ishinomaki. 